Welcome to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. I'm your host, Tim Reed. And once again, I am so excited to be here. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. Now, I didn't know if we'd have this episode back when I started at the beginning of the season, but after going through all 12 episodes so far and getting the amazing questions from you guys that I've received, we had to come back and do a bonus episode that's all about Q&A. You know, it's really fun to interview these guests and to try to get content that's going to be useful for the audience, but I love Q&A because this helps us dive deep, and a lot of the time in interviews and stuff, it's very easy to speak um, hyperbolically or kind of in like sweeping absolutes because that's the format of interviews and, and kind of quick soundbite statements and stuff. But I love Q&A because we can dive deep and really nuance out what's going to be the right thing for your specific context. So, so excited to move ahead with that today. But first of all, I actually have to give a shout out to Grant Falco for last week's episode. Uh, Grant was gracious enough to interview me for, uh, for my own show, which I don't know what that says about my ego, but Grant did an amazing job. And uh, he was able to hardball me with some questions that he had and he'd kind of heard from other people as well throughout the course of the season. And, and he did a, a phenomenal job with that. So I'm just amazed at how gracious he was. And, you know, he said some really, really kind things about me. So Grant, I appreciate it, man. You did an awesome job. Now, for everyone listening, uh, Grant is actually teaching a class at Expo this year. And so if you're going to be at the HPBA Expo in Dallas, Texas, you need to check out his class at 945 in the morning on Wednesday, March 13th. His class is called Get Over It conquering the fear of social media. I'm telling you, Grant has something to say about social media and uh, you will vastly improve your company's presence if you check that out. Okay, so moving on. Uh, season one, it's been, it's been unbelievable. You know, as I look at our metrics, I mean, we are covering nearly every state in the U.S. We're in multiple countries, provinces of Canada, and, and it's just amazing. I look back at the guests, the conversations that we've had, and, uh, I, you know, it's just, I'm just humbled at, at, how far it's spread and and just and just everything that that's come to be in the podcast it, it it I didn't envision it going exactly the way that it's gone when I when I first had this idea a while back so I want to just thank you guys for committing to growing your business and committing to dive deep because without you listening I mean it's just it's just me talking in an echo chamber so thank you so much for wanting to make that commitment to grow your businesses now Season one is coming to an end. I mean, this is truly the last episode, I promise. (laughs) This is is the end of season one. And we're going to take a break for a few months, but I have an idea for the beginning of season two. We'll see if we can pull this off. But what I'd like to do is have the first episode of season two be a live episode at HPBA Expo in Dallas, Texas this March. And so what I'd like to do is to find a manufacturer that actually wants to host the Firetime podcast live in their booth. And we'll find a way to do it. Uh, We can do an awesome interview. We can do some Q&A. But uh, I'm working on that right now. If you happen to work for a manufacturer or know of a manufacturer you think would be great, have them hit me up. My email address is tim at itsfiretime.com. That's Tim at itsfiretime.com. Now, another thing at Expo is if you see me walking around, (laughs) I want to have something awesome for you. So if you see me walking around, let me know how the podcast is doing for you and ask what I have for you because I got a little special surprise for any of the podcast listeners that track me down at Expo. I'll be walking around. I I believe I'll be there all the days, but at least Wednesday through Friday for sure. Um, The last thing is this is... On Wednesday, I'm going to be teaching uh, a, a class very similar to Grant. My class is, I believe, at 3.30 in the afternoon, and it's all about eliminating customer confusion and making it easier for people to buy from us. And what I'd like to do Wednesday night is to actually have a podcast meetup, so stay tuned for that. But if you're a podcast listener and you want to meet up, we can find a local bar nearby to kind of talk through stuff, get to know each other a little bit. I would love for this community to become kind of like a family, and it'd be awesome to, to meet face-to-face face. So stick around for that. Season two should be amazing and we'll kick that off live at Expo next year and we'll try to do some kind of a meetup most likely on Wednesday night. Now I know that was a lot. So with all of that said, I can't wait to dive into your questions. Here we go. 
All right, so we are going to be jumping into questions that you guys have been asking all season long. Uh, in some of these, I'm going to list the name of the person and where they're from. In other ones, I am going to protect the names of the innocent, depending on the context of the question. But anyway, I'm really excited about this because here's where we get to dive super deep on your business specifically. You know, it's awesome in interviews to be able to give sweeping answers. And, and a lot of the time, I, I talk in hyperbole whenever I'm, I'm speaking uh, just because of the, the type of context that an interview comes in. But Q&A is awesome because this helps get a little bit more nuanced and kind of dive a little bit deeper into your specific business and context. So thank you for the questions. I hope that you guys find a ton of value with these responses. Now, this is also a episode that I am filming right now, and I'm going to be putting this up on YouTube and also on my website if you guys want to check it out that way. So uh, all the uhs and ands and stutters, you guys are going to hear all of it. Um, I'm not editing any of this down. So you're going to get to see me in my uh, my natural flow. So, okay, we're going to jump into this now. Question number one is from Patrick in South Carolina. And Patrick says, hi, Tim, two questions for your Q&A episode that have occurred while listening thus far. Number one, do you have a rubric or an evaluation sheet that your team uses when you do practice selling? What does it look like for you? And number two, in your conversation with Eric Camp, you talked about using Outlook as a scheduling tool. I'd love to hear more about this and how you organize the data that you get back from installers, like the photos of finished installations that you mentioned. Thanks, and really enjoying all your hard work to make this podcast useful. Well, I mean, first of all, thanks, Patrick. It's awesome that you say that, and I really appreciate you asking the question. Um, To dive into question number one about if I have a rubric or an evaluation for sales, uh, I absolutely do. So my whole thing is that I'm huge on practicing. If you listened to the last episode where Grant Falco interviewed me, you know that practicing is a huge, huge deal for my team. And I believe it's the number one reason that we've been able to grow the way that we have. Um, But that being said, unless you have a specific sales process that you have outlined for your team to go through, it's going to be really difficult to practice. And this goes back to the Zig Ziglar quote where he's famous for saying, if you aim at nothing you'll hit it every time. And so unless you have a process that your team can look to and knows that that's the way it should go, practice is difficult because there's no basis for kind of critiquing and affirming and things like that. It's all just based on like your gut instinct as opposed to a process you've developed. So with our team, we have a seven step sales process and yours might be different than this. I mean, there's not one that's right or one that's wrong, Um, but our seven steps are, are really simple. Step one is greeting. Step two is understanding. Step three is advise. Step four is make a plan. Step five, call to action. Step six, pursue. And step seven, gratitude. And so just the fact that we have a seven-step process helps us when we practice because we we know what we're aiming at. I don't know if that makes sense, but I would would think hard about what that process is. It doesn't have to be seven steps. It could be three steps or it could be 20 steps, but but you'll want to come up with your process first. And it's okay. I mean, if you don't know where to start, just think about, well, what's the first thing we should do when the customer walks in the showroom? Well, we should probably say hi, or we should probably greet them, right? Or that's your introduction. So there's step one of your process. What's the second thing that you do when the customer comes in the showroom? If you think about that for a little bit and put your pen to paper, you're going to come up with some steps. Now, once you've got a sales process, what we do is I've got a kind of one page form that lists each of the seven steps of the process. And then we have five little check boxes after each step. And I mean, the check boxes are really simple. I don't have my sheet in front of me, but like, you know, step one, for greeting, you know, what's one thing you should always have in a greeting? Well, you should probably make eye contact with the person, introduce yourself and give them a firm handshake. So maybe you've got a little checkbox that says uh, introduction and handshake. You know, in the greeting process, um, you should probably not be robotic. You should probably say something funny or ask a question about them or do something to break the ice. So maybe you have another little checkbox that says icebreaker. And and for each step of the sales process, I've got five little checkboxes. And the whole thing is that these are just, you know, intangible things that you should do every time you greet a customer, or if you're trying to understand them, you're going to be able to come up with five things that should be done during that process. And so we do that. And that gives us a baseline for at least when we're, when we're listening to the salesperson uh, practice, we can just check the boxes of what they did or they didn't do. And you can assign a grade to it, or even just use that as talking points. 
So the next thing is this, is that that's kind of what our, our rubric is, is that step one, we've got a process that we go through. Step two is a rubric. And then our rhythm is that we practice we affirm, and then we critique. And, and that's another thing, too, is that everyone practices, including me. So, so when one of my team members practices, I might have like, I don't know, five things that are really a negative critique that I want to say to them, but I always want to affirm what is working, number one. And, and I think about it, you know, if, if I'm practicing, that puts you in a vulnerable spot. You know, it's really good to get affirmed and, and you know that the people around you care about you and they can affirm what you're good at before they just dive into a critique. So, so our rhythm is that you practice and then the whole team affirms what worked and then you jump into a couple critiques of what didn't. Um, another thing that's really helpful in scenarios for practicing is to actually uh, spend some time brainstorming what the customer scenario is. So it's, it's kind of silly, but sometimes I'll be up to like 10, 11 o'clock at night uh, working on like five different scenarios for five different team members where I'll say, okay, this is a, this, this, you're this customer. You've got a two story house. that's about 2000 square feet. You've got a masonry chimney. You have gas to your fireplace already. You're looking for aesthetics and warmth. You say that your budget is $3,500, but you truly have $4,500 for this project. So, you know, something like that, but we'll actually go that deep with, with every single one. We find that's how the most effective practices are, are done. Okay. Now on to question number two about Eric camp and, uh, using outlook as a scheduling tool. So, you know, what, what I do is really, really simple. You know, we use outlook for scheduling all of our in-home previews with customers. And, and there's a couple ways you can do this. What we generally do is every team member's got their own calendar. And at least with my team, we don't share calendars, but basically anytime we schedule an in-home preview, we schedule it as an appointment. And then we simply invite all of the other team members to it. And that way, when they accept the appointment, it's on everyone's calendar. Excuse me. Now, another way that you could do this, this is the way that Eric does it, is you can have one administrator that has administrative access over all of your team members' calendars. So anytime there's going to be a job preview or a service call or an installation, you put it into everyone's calendar with um, like an alert buffer so that an hour before or an hour and a half before they get a reminder. That way they can call if they're running late. Um, But that just makes it so that everybody in one spot can see all of the different appointments and it makes it really easy to tell what's going on. Now, there's nothing wrong with going with more in-depth scheduling programs. There's actually, my company uh, uses some really in-depth scheduling stuff for our installation. Uh, But frankly, you know, unless you're operating on a huge scale, you don't need to. And and that's the reason that we use Outlook for our previews is I've got about 11 uh, direct report salespeople and there's just not enough of us to to justify some big intricate system. So for all of our in-home job previews, we just use Outlook because it's really simple, it's free and it gets us everything that we need. Um, Now, when you ask the question about hearing more about how we organize the data that we get back from installers and photos of finished products, you know, there's a few ways to do it. Um, The company I work for, Fireside Home Solutions, we have invested a ton of money into a proprietary software system that has basically built everything in for us where we can upload pictures from our phones. We can check jobs in real time as they're being installed. And it gives us, I mean, margin control, um, time cards, finished pictures, measurements. I mean, everything that we need. There's good things and bad things with that. But the reality is most companies don't need that. My advice would be just to get started with a Google Drive account. You know, a free one, I think, gives you up to 15 gigs of data. And then for a very, very minimal price, you can sign up for a, you know, more data than you'll ever use. And I'd recommend just getting your company set up on a Google Drive. And you could have a job folder for, you know, every customer that you could put their last name, comma, first name, and then their address. And that way you can search through your database by address and by job names. And what you could do is just have the installer snap all the pictures. They could do Either upload them directly into the Google Drive, or if you don't trust the installers with that, they can upload them to a different drive or email them to a team member, and you can have an administrative person get them uploaded into the drive. But um, you know, I'll tell you that it is a huge, huge, huge help 
having a Google Drive where you can store all that information, job notes, pictures, customer information, just if you ever get called back on it or if you ever you know need that information to pinch, you know exactly where to go. Um, the last thing I would say when you start to go through the process of like documenting your installs, uh, putting your notes and your pictures all into one uh, Google Drive or, or wherever you're going to put it is this kind of goes back to the first thing with the sales process is that I would work on defining what a signature installation is. And so what I mean by that is in the same way that I've defined a seven step sales process for my team, I would do the same thing for your installer. So figure out what you guys call a signature installation and hold them accountable to it and make them take pictures of it. So like for us, we are going to be spray painting every nailing flange on our ZC fireplaces. So that way if the fireplace ever gets moved, we're going to see our paint was, uh, our paint mark was destroyed. So we can actually tell that we are going to spray paint every single pipe joint that happens anywhere on the pipe run. So that way we can tell if people have unscrewed our pipe, we're going to take a picture of a level on the fireplace in multiple different spots of a level level on the vent pipe in multiple different spots, take a picture of the tape measure showing clearance to combustible in multiple different spots. You know, you know where I'm going with this, but I would work on defining a signature install and hold your install teams accountable to it in the same way that you hold your sales teams accountable to a sales process. Um, one last thing about a sales process before we move to the next question, <laughs> this episode is going to go forever the way that I'm talking here, is that when it comes to a sales process, I'm huge on process, but I hate micromanagement. And that's a line that I would be careful not to go too far on. So when I look at a sales process, I am not forcing a person to be a robot. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm painting lines on the basketball court so that everyone can play the same game. You know, very often a sales process can get so micromanaged that people are like, well, I don't have any personality in this. That's not what you want because you want salespeople that are effective and they're working in their element. But the reality is, you know, if I'm going to drive from my house to the airport, I'm going to have to get on one freeway before another one. And then I'm going to have to take this exit. Then I'm going to have to take this exit. And it doesn't matter what lane I'm in. It doesn't matter how fast I'm going. There is a route to the airport. And that's how your sales process should operate is you are not forcing people into micromanaging them. You're not changing their personality, but you're simply painting lines on the basketball court so they know the way to get to their destination. You know, it's like the whole idea of, you know, step one, greet your customer. Step two, understand their needs. Step three, advise a solution. You know, those are just natural steps that don't force people into a box, but rather they illuminate a path for your people to take. So I hope that that helps you. Okay, moving on. Question number two. Tim, my parents are retiring and us siblings are going to be the new owners of our hearth shop. We're trying to figure out how to divide up leadership and it's tricky. We have different skill sets and philosophies about the way to run a business. How do we decide on leadership roles? It seems like it's possible to have co-workers, but not co-leaders. People around us have affirmed that I have the natural skill set to lead the company, but I don't want to offend or hurt my family members. Do you have any advice for us? Wow. Great question. And I'd imagine that there's a lot of people that are in a similar spot. Okay. So I think, I think number one, um, anytime you're dealing with, uh, Family stuff like this, it's tricky. There's a lot of emotions that are involved. There's a lot of sometimes like unsaid expectations, especially when you've got siblings that are involved or maybe one person thought, oh, I'm going to take over the business and maybe um, it seems like somebody else has a more natural skill set for that. So number one, my advice would be uh, for you that's asking this question, honesty and self-awareness is going to be critical. And obviously the fact that you're asking this question shows that you have, you know, some level of self-awareness. I found very often in family situations, people are not always self-aware um, of their their skill sets, of the way that they come across, and of what they bring to the table. And so I think that there's got to be a fine line of gut-wrenching, difficult honesty of Maybe, maybe it's a sibling conversation. Maybe it's the parents speaking into it. Maybe it's a neutral third party that can speak into the situation, can evaluate the skill sets of the different siblings and can say, look, um, this is going to be the person that's most suited for leadership. This is going to be the person that's most suited for, you know, something else. Um, but I think that, that there, there has to be some honesty. You can't walk on eggshells, but at the same time of that, there's got to be radical self-awareness that, that if there is a sibling or a family member that, that thinks they're more of a leader than they are, or thinks they have what it takes to run the company and they don't, I guess you just got to ask yourself, um, is it worth ruining a family over your business? And I would say that the answer is no, it's not. I mean, um, 
there are always other opportunities, and uh, and sometimes it's worth if it is truly a family mess that there is um, no getting out of, not because of you, but because of the other people involved. I personally think it's better to cut bait and walk away than ruin a family over a business. So, but, but I think that honesty and self awareness is going to be you know a couple key things for you. Uh, number two is going to be this: is that servant leadership is going to be critical. So you asked about how do you decide on leadership roles? It seems like it's possible to have co workers but not co leaders. You know, I, I I get what you're what you're saying there. I I truly believe that there can be co leaders, but there can only be one vision. And so this is probably what you're alluding to: is that. Um, there's got to be one person in the company that makes the final decision, that casts the vision for the company. Once that vision is cast, there can be a ton of leaders underneath that that all work together in their own unique ways with their own unique skill sets to move the company in the direction of that shared vision. But when you've got one leader aiming at one thing, one leader aiming at something else, and none of them are aligned to a shared vision, it's not going to be pretty. And so uh, I think what you need there is you're going to need servant leadership. So here's something that we have really backwards and messed up is that in our you know, culture, very often we think when it comes to being a leader, that means that people serve us. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The higher up on the leadership rung that you go, the more of a servant you become. And so if you truly are the head leader, the head honcho, the El Presidente of your company, that literally means that you are the chief servant officer. It is your job to be a servant to everybody in your company. What can you do to make them win? What can you do to help them achieve their dreams? And and that's going to serve you really well in dealing with siblings. If you can show, hey, I am a servant to help you. Our roles are different. I have casted some vision, but this vision is so that you can thrive and you can win as a part of our company. Um, you know, another thing is going to be humility. That's going to be really big. I think there's going to need, need to be a lot of humility on both ends. On the end of uh, you, the sibling, that you know, obviously people think you have a natural skill set for leadership, and you're going to have to be probably very humble and maybe in some ways move a little bit slower and more graciously than you might think you'd need to. Um, but also, there's going to need to be humility on the account of these other family members or siblings to maybe swallow a little bit of humble pie and say, you know what, um, I wanted to be the chief you know, leader of this company. I wanted to cast the vision, but my skill set is actually not the best for that. I am okay buying into the vision of my sibling because they are more naturally uh, suited for that. That's been affirmed by family members, by outside, you know, people. And uh, there's got to be humility all the way around. Now, one thing too with this is that, you know, you can still share equity even with your siblings, but still have different roles. So for instance, in, in the company I work for fireside, we have a majority owner and a minority owner, the majority owner, John Waterstrap, my boss was on a couple episodes ago and he is the cook in the kitchen. He cast the vision for fireside, but his business partner is still a partner in the company and his role is a little bit different. And it's okay. You can have you can have co-owners in the company and you can have co-leaders, but I'm with you that there's there's one person that needs to cast that vision. Um, but I think it's okay if siblings still want to share equity 50-50 or you know, 30-30-30, whatever it is. Um, but you gotta be super clear there's gotta be different roles. So with all that too, I think that what I'd recommend doing is maybe get with a consultant or a third party uh, person or entity to define the roles and expectations for the company. I feel like every question goes back to defining roles, whether it's a sales process or installation process, but I would get your company on paper and I would define some roles and and I would talk openly about this, about, hey, where do we see us going? Uh, what are the positions that we need to get us there? Where are we uh, naturally gifted to help with that and get those roles on paper and then start to divvy up what those assignments are. And I think that again, with some honesty and some self-awareness, um, coming at this with a perspective of humility and servant leadership and defining those roles of this is where we are, this is where we see us going, that's going to help you decide what seats on the bus need to be occupied by what people are going to naturally fit them. I don't know if that makes sense or not. I, I hope it does. But I would say at the end of the day, if you get deep in this, if it's a family situation that will not get better, if it's got a lot of crazy involved in it, 
I I would cut bait and do something else. You're clearly skilled. You clearly have you know leadership cap- capabilities that other people are affirming. And I would I would fight for the family business. But if it gets to a point where it's either the business or your relationships, I mean you 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 got to take those relationships every day. I hope that helps you out. Okay, next question. Uh, this is from Bill in Pennsylvania, and Bill says, "Thanks for the podcast." I just listened to your conversation with Eric Camp. I've been running a small hearth retail mom and pop for many years. How simple you and Eric make it sound. Management of a a profitable seasonal service and installation operation has been our most challenging task and gets more so every year. You're correct in noting the key is quality employees. We struggle to keep our four guys busy March through August, and then we suffer overload from September through February. Hey, Bill, first of all, thanks for the question. I'm so glad that you enjoyed the episode with Eric. Um, yeah, this is a really, really good question. So a couple things that I would point out. Um, number one, <laughs> you talked about how simple me and Eric made it sound. You know, what I would say is that is that simple uh, doesn't mean easy. You know, when, when you think about what great businesses do, they execute the basics again and again and again and again all the time, every time. And so I think that, that when we make it sound simple, um, drawing up the play, that's, that's simple, but, but running the play is where it's really difficult. And that's why you get paid a ton of money to be a leader that, that can help shepherd your people towards that goal. Cause you know, it, it, it's simple to draw the play up and to say, okay, this is how we're going to do our signature install. This is how we're going to do our sales process. This is how we're, this is how we're going to define our meetings and manage our people. But then running the play, that's where a leader is, is worth their weight in gold because it takes a leader to be constantly, constantly reminding people of that vision, reminding them of that vision, shepherd them towards the goal. And, and that's the difficult part. So yes, I would say drawing up the play is simple, but it's, it's far from easy. Um, so the second thing is this is, is I would definitely think as you're talking about, you know, management of uh, a profitable service and install operation is again, I, I go back to defining standard operations, uh, procedures, and then expectations. So I think that in, in everything, I would just make sure that you, that you've drawn up a game plan. So again, the fact that this business is, is seasonal, um, you know, one thing to think about might be if you're experiencing overload September through February, which, you know, I mean, most companies are, you know, what I would think about is your, your A priority jobs, your B priority jobs and your C priority jobs. And, you know, um, I don't know the kind of work you do, but in, in, uh, you know, September through February, your A priority jobs are probably like a gas to gas insert, right? It's a gas insert where there's already gas on in the fireplace. Maybe a wood burning insert is an A level job as well. Um, maybe you're looking at a customer that wants a, uh, remove and replace ZC fireplace where there's going to be some electrical work, gas line, uh, cement board, and, and even stone work. Well, that, that could be a great job, but, but that's probably a C level job in September through February, because in the time it takes you to do that, you can install six to eight gas to gas inserts or, or wood inserts. So again, think about defining standard procedures and expectations for what are the kinds of jobs we want this time of year? What are the kinds of jobs that we want in the off season? And, and that can help manage workflow quite a bit. We've seen success with that, you know, and I would, and I would too, you know, don't be afraid if you get these, uh, C priority jobs in September through February, just be honest with customers and say, look, we are so slammed right now. We can absolutely do this job, but because of all the capacity we're going to have to push off, it's actually going to cost $1,500 more. Here's what I'd love. If we can push this job off to February, we're going to reduce the price by 1500 bucks. You're going to get a screaming deal. And besides no one wants their house torn up during the holiday season anyway. You know, not everyone goes for that, but but we have found that that kind of managing those jobs and understanding understanding the um, the operating cost is is huge, and and that can help to some degree balance out some seasonality. Um, it's, just, it's just one thing that that you could be thinking about. Um, another thing is this: is that when it comes to seasonality in businesses. Um, I would say, you know, number one, I would dive deep with your sales team to work on making them better. And this is just what I found. I, I found that as I've, as I've started to, uh, you know, speak at different events and talk with companies, most sales teams are running at 50% effectiveness, maybe. I mean, most, they really are. Most teams are running at maybe 50% effectiveness. And, and so w- the way that I would look at that is I would say, 
most likely your sales team, if it's anything like mine, has enormous opportunity to grow. And that can help you a lot to balance out seasonality. So again, going back to the basics, um, like the last question of sales practice, creating a sales system, um, I would recommend teaching your team to keep a quote log of all their estimates that are out there. Follow up, you know, figure out, do you want them to follow up three times with customers, seven times, 10 times? How often do you want them to follow up and then your job as a leader is going to be to measure that, hold them accountable to it. And and again, you know, we've seen huge success with this. Uh, we have one, you know, sales rep on our team that's he's three years in. You know, year one as a new rep, he did about three hundred fifty grand in sales. Year two, with some of this practice, he was able to jump to eight fifty. And then year three, he's he's going over uh, one point one million dollars by himself. So the whole thing with that is that there's not any magic. It's just practice, you know, practice, get them, um, in a routine of keeping a quote log, mining that quote log, calling customers back and constantly working on their craft. Um, increasing the effectiveness of your sales team will help your seasonality quite a bit, uh, quite a bit. Now <laughs> it might make you crazy or even crazier in uh, September through February, but Hey, that's a good problem to have. Again, you know, take the best jobs, push the, push the B and C level jobs out. And if you lose those ones, you know, Hey, that's a good problem to have. Um, number three, I would say this would be to mine your customer base like crazy. So again, anytime you have a service related business, you should be thinking about that future business. So I would create an Excel spreadsheet of every installation you've done for the last three years. And I would start setting up, when are we going to call them for their annual inspection? When are we going to call them for their chimney sweep? Maybe there's two or three things with every customer that you can, that you can, uh, market to them a few times a year and turn them into year round customers. And, and I truly, truly believe that the reoccurring service business over the course of five to 10 years from a single customer will actually gain you more in profit dollars than the original install. So that's what I would do. Uh, I hope that that helps. It's a, it's a great question. It's a challenge that everybody faces, but those are some things that I would think about. Um, there's a great, great saying that um, one of the owners in our company has has told me quite a bit, and his name is Jeff Melberg. He's actually got the guy that hired me at Fireside. And he said, Tim, when there's no wind in your sails, get out the oars and paddle. And so what I would be thinking about when it comes to that seasonality is that, you know, seasonality is it's a great thing. You know, when the weather gets cold, we all love it. It kind of helps us be um, even more busy than we would be. A lot of companies can be, they can be kind of lazy and then, you know, they're busy anyway because people just need fireplaces then. But I love what Jeff said, when there's no wind in your sails, get out the oars and paddle. And I would think hard about what does it mean for you to paddle? Most hearth companies are not used to that. They're used to just riding the weather wave when it comes and then when it cools off, they just kind of scoot along until, you know, it picks back up again. And um, I think that there's things you can do to get out the oars and paddle. So I would I would leave you with that quote. It, it has helped me tremendously. Okay, next up is this. Any advice for a new business owner? I've been a longtime installer, but I'm just coming into ownership now. Again, that's a really, really good question. Um Here's what I would think about as a new business owner. And actually, I, I wrote about this in my ebook. Um, if you go to my website, it's firetime.com. There's a link right on the front homepage that says free ebook. And uh, you can you can download it right there. The ebook is called Roadmap to Success. And um, I would honestly just point you towards that. I found the biggest thing when it comes to uh, stepping into a new leadership role is is setting basic expectations. You know, so often in companies, um, people fight frustration and burnout because they don't know what's expected of them. They get frustrated when leadership tells them to do things that that they aren't sure about or that they didn't realize was part of their job description. And so in uh, that ebook, Roadmap to Success, I outline um, five basic steps, like a roadmap to basically move your company in a direction where you can rally people to yourself and grow your business like never before. And I'm just going to give you really quick rapid fire here, the five steps in the roadmap. So uh, step number one is expectations and goal setting. I, I truly believe that defining expectations and setting goals will offer unbelievable clarity for your people. They're going to buy in, especially when they see how accomplishing these goals helps make them more money, give them a better livelihood and, and just make their lives better in general. So number one, expectations and goal setting. 
Number two is going to be invest in your people. And I get into this in the ebook, but there are there are ways to invest in your people through coaching relationships, through mentoring relationships, where they truly know and believe that you care about them. So step two is invest in your people, especially as a new owner. If you've been a longtime installer, you know these people, but how awesome would it be coming into a position of ownership to now say, hey, look, now that I have the keys, I'm going to prove to you how much I care about you. I'm going to invest in you because we only win when you guys are taken care of. (laughs) That's an awesome thing that anybody wants to rally around. Okay, so step one is expectations and goal setting. Step two is invest in your people. Step three, audit your marketing. Now, this is a general statement. I think there's a marketing question a little bit later on. Um, I would audit every marketing dollar you spend. My belief, I, I'm not joking when I say this, that I believe most companies in our industry are, are wasting 90% of their marketing dollars. And what I mean by that is I believe that if I could come into your company and you would show me your website, you'd open up your books and show me your spends, I believe that together we could cut 90% of your spends and you would get the same results that you're getting right now. So a lot of that's because people just aren't tracking it. They're dumping all this money into whatever, print or radio, TV, Facebook, and you you know, to some degree, all that stuff can be good, but if you're not tracking it, um, you know, it, it, it does not set you up for success. It, it just, it, uh, it, it starts a really bad cycle of, uh, you know, of zero accountability and, and you want to break that cycle. So you want to be auditing your marketing spends. Uh, step number four is going to be website simplification. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to jump into this quite as much in season one as I would have liked to in season two, we will definitely be talking about this, but I believe, uh, Every single website in our industry that I have ever seen, with the exception of one, needs to be radically simplified. Uh, generally speaking, our websites just <laughs> vomit information on customers. And, uh, you know, Donald Miller from Story Brand is really great because he always talks about how your website's a first date. You know, when someone goes to your website, they don't want to know about your creepy ex-wives and past relationships. They don't want to get to the marriage altar right there. It's a first date. They just want to know, hey, are you competent? Are you attractive? And can you give me enough to show that you actually can help me solve my problem? So there's more about that later, but I would radically simplify the web page, cut a lot of the text out, um, think about it from a consumer's perspective, eliminate insider language like BTUs, zero clearance, direct van, all that stuff. Um, but simplifying your website will uh, grow your company in huge leaps and bounds. As a new owner, there's there's never a better time to do that. And then number five is going to be to dive deep in the customer experience. I, I, I get into this more in the ebook, but going all in on the consumer experience from the way that your sales team uh, operates, the way they treat customers. Customers, what's your buying process? What's your quoting process? How do you price jobs out? Uh, diving all in on the customer experience will pay huge dividends. So, circling back, you asked for advice from a business owner. I'll refer you to my ebook, Roadmap to Success. Again, you can get that by going to the website, it's firetime.com. But the five steps on the roadmap is this number one, expectations and goal setting. Number two, invest in your people. Number three, audit your marketing. Number four, website simplification, and then number five, go all in on your customer experience. Hope that helps you out. All right, next question here. Tim, what advice do you have for a new sales rep in this industry? I work for a large manufacturer and I'm trying to learn quickly. Well, Hey, that's uh, first of all, congratulations on the, on the new position. It's awesome that you're working for a big manufacturer and that you're excited about being a sales rep. Um, you know, these are a couple things that I would think about. So, so one of which is that um, when you're a sales rep selling to dealers, I, I can't tell you how often people just barge into one of our showrooms looking for me. If I happen to be there, they just march into my office, think I can drop everything and that the most important thing in the world is what they have to say. Um, you know, I really try to be gracious, but I have very little patience for people that can't respect my schedule. And so th- that's true for any leader. I mean, there is nothing worse than a rep just barging in unannounced, no appointment and expecting that you'll drop everything to see them. So, so number one, I would say, um, you know, learn all the product. Absolutely. But just basic advice, you know, for your appointments, I, I would actually schedule appointments with your dealers and, and ask them how, how often ahead do you want me to come by? How much time do you want to have? And, and I would just, this just basic common courtesy and respect that, that frankly, you know, almost no reps follow in our industry. And, and if you do that, you're going to be the consummate professional that, that that's going to go a long ways. Um, 
you know, number two is this. Uh, I got to tip my hat, first of all, to Brad Hartman from the Behind Your Back podcast. I'm going to post a link to it in the show notes. Um, he has an amazing podcast. He's out of the Texas area for people that are selling in the LBM industry to builders. And, uh, and you know, he talks a lot about how the job of a good rep is to basically present information to their customers that helps them save money, helps them make money, helps them eliminate waste, or helps make them look really good to their company. And so here's what I mean by that. You know, the last thing that I want when a sales rep comes in my door is to show me a brochure and start yakking about how many BTUs their product is. And, you know, we've got a, whatever, a plus 15% and a plus 5% multiplier if you do this or that or the other. I don't care about that. You know, you can email that to me and I, I can read that on my own time. Um, when a rep comes in to see me, if they can come in and say, hey, Tim, I've been looking at your different showrooms and I noticed that you've got this product line on the floor. From the research I've done, I don't think your margin is where it needs to be. I would love to offer you this product instead that can raise your margin points and help make you more money and your team more commission. I'm going to listen to that rep. But when a rep just shoves a brochure in my face and says, I got this new product, it's got 30,000 BTUs and we got you know all this delivery and everything, I just don't care about that. So, you know, again, do the legwork ahead of time to identify the weaknesses or the opportunities that your dealers have and be be targeting with surgical precision the message to that dealer. So you might have 10 products to sell, but find the one pain point that your dealer really has and go all in on that. Because if you can, again, help them save money or earn more money, and you win that battle, you're going to start to get credibility to showcase more and more and more of your product line. But if you throw the whole book at the dealer, um, you know, you're going to be just like every other rep. So, um, yeah, that's, that's just something that I would think about. Another thing that I would think about too, is how can you make your dealers look smart? So For example, dealers that are listening to this podcast are wanting to grow their businesses. And a lot of us are just overwhelmed in the day-to-day figuring out, well, you know, how do I do this? What do I need? Um, What resources should I have? So, man, I would say, you know, go into your dealers with articles, with podcasts. I mean, hey, maybe send them this podcast, but send them information that's going to help make them look smarter, either to their employees or to their partners or to the owner of the company. You know, if, if a rep sends me an email or, you know, has an appointment with me and they say, Hey Tim, um, I printed off this article in the Harvard business journal for you because I think it really applies to your business. I read it. I wanted, I wanted to just explain it to you because I think there's some huge opportunity here, man. I am going to thank that rep. I'm going to listen to them and they're going to start to build credibility as like a business advisor that I can go to when I have questions. And it's also going to make me look really smart. You know, if I, if I go into a, into a team meeting and I've just read this article and you know, maybe, maybe I can, I can print it out and give it to my team and say, Hey guys, this is some great content that I want you guys to be up on. I want you to be thinking about it. Um, it's going to make me look really good in front of my team. So as a new rep, you know, obviously the product stuff is good to know, and, and I'm sure your company can train you on that, but I would just think a ton about, you know, number one, have basic common courtesy when it comes to appointments with your dealers. Um, number two, uh, find ways to help them save money make money or look smart. And you are going to just, you're going you're to go so far with that. Um, number three, I wish the more reps would do this. Teach sales teams how to sell. I really, really wish that when a rep came in for a scheduled appointment and they had my whole sales team in front of them, I wish they wouldn't talk about, again, BTUs and direct vent technology and all that stuff. I don't care about that. I can read that in a brochure. My team can read that in a brochure. What I want from a rep is for them to teach my team how to sell their product. And if a rep can come in and say, hey, look, Tim, I've got this great product. You've got this huge margin opportunity. Can I get 45 minutes with your team to teach them how to sell it? I'm going to say take an hour and a half. I mean, cause that's that again, it helps me win. It helps my team win. And, and it's going to be, you know, really good for you in the long run. So becoming a teacher of how to sell your products would be huge. Um, I hope that that helps you a lot. Okay. We're flying here. Cause I know that I'm going long on these questions. Okay. Next question. Oh, okay. Actually, this is, this is just something that I wanted to point out. Um, I was listening through the, the last episode of mine with, with Grant interviewing me. And, uh, it's always, it's always weird to listen to yourself. But again, from my days of playing in a punk band, I'm, I'm used to listening to myself be an idiot while the 
you know, record button is pushed. With all of that said, um, I want to make a clarification uh, from the last episode. At the end of the episode, I talked about how companies are wasting so much money in the industry magazines with bad marketing, and it just drives me crazy. Well, that's really, really true, but I want I wanted to nuance that just a little bit. Um, I truly do believe that I flip through the industry magazines every month, and I'm just dumbfounded at the advertising that companies pay money for. But what I want to clarify is it's not that advertising in our industry magazines are bad. I actually think that that's a really good thing because if you're selling a product that your customer is a dealer base, you know that virtually every dealer has their eyes on that magazine. So I'm not saying it's bad to advertise in print or in a magazine, but what I'm saying is bad is that um, most messages that I see in these industry magazines are for consumers. They're not for dealers. And so I'm sitting there thinking like, there's this stupid ad for a fireplace that's, you know, talking about uh, BTUs and, and clearances and, and, and the way that the way that they've the way that they've marketed it is it is not for a dealer, it's completely for the end consumer. And I'm sitting here thinking, why are you paying this money when the customer is the dealer? So if you are a manufacturer that's advertising in industry magazines, I would not use the same content that you would use in a, in a consumer facing magazine, um, as this dealer magazine. So, you know, for instance, if you're going to show a fireplace and your tagline for it in the consumer magazine is, you know, the most exquisite fireplace that, that money can buy or, you know, affordable excellence or whatever. I mean, those are horrendous ads, but that's a different conversation, but those are consumer facing ads. When you're marketing to dealers and industry magazines, you need to solve the dealer's problem. The dealer doesn't care how many faces you offer. The dealer doesn't care how many sizes you offer. They can get that from anybody. What the dealer wants is, do you want to make more money? Do you want to stand out from the competition? Our fireplaces will differentiate you and help your company grow like never before. You know, those are problems that dealers have that you can solve. I would just be really, really intentional with not reusing your ads in the industry magazines. Um, you know, I guess not making your, your, your ads the same in the industry magazines as they are in the consumer facing ones because they're two totally different audiences that require two totally different marketing pieces. Again, think about who's your audience. If it's a dealer, make your ad about solving the dealer's problems. Well, what are the dealer's problems? They want to make more money. They want to in- increase their margin. They want to stand out from their competition. They want an edge uh, against online shopping. So craft all of your ads to that. Don't waste time spouting about BTUs, sizes of fireplaces. We've been crafting the best things since 1976. The quality you can trust. Don't care about that. So I hope that that helps. Um, On that same note, you know, when it comes to marketing, again, you know, I argue that that 90% of the marketing dollars that companies spend is wasted. I, I truly believe that. And, and again, that's whether you're at the dealer level, the distributor level, or the manufacturer level. Um, I, I really believe that, that if, if we sat down, uh, we could strategically cut 90% of your spends and give you the same results that you're getting now. And people ask, I mean, that's crazy, 90%. Here's the thing. And, and this is what I base that on. Number one is bad websites. So the fact is, most websites in our industry are bad. I, they just are. Most websites are bad. And and I would say, you know, if you're spending all this money to send people to a bad website that doesn't retain customers, it confuses them and they hit the back button, you're wasting a lot of that marketing money. Um, number two is that a lot of companies aren't tracking their spends. Now, as you get to bigger and bigger companies, you probably are tracking more of it, but I found there's a general lack of tracking. If you said, well, we spend this much for this print ad in this magazine, you should know how much business that brings you. Um, and you know, if you, if you make a social media push, you should know how much business that brings you. So no tracking is another reason that a lot of that money is wasted. And then reason number three that I believe 90% of the marketing dollars that most companies spend in our industry is wasted is because of confusing messaging. Um, you know, there are major manufacturers that that their front page real estate on their website or in their print or digital marketing is all about BTUs and direct vent technology and sealed combustion and, you know, 15 decorative fronts to choose from, whatever it is. Um, that's actually really confusing messaging for customers. They don't understand it. It doesn't mean anything to them and it doesn't solve a problem. So again, going back to the fact that generally speaking, companies have bad websites. Uh, generally speaking, there's a lack of tracking uh, on marketing spends. And then generally speaking, there's extremely confusing messaging. 
I believe that most companies uh, could cut their marketing by 90% and get the same results that they're getting now. That's an, anyway, that's like the, that's like the 30 second synopsis of uh, the theory that I have. Again, we can dive deeper on this next season. Um, one thing I want to point out too, uh, someone's talked to me a little bit ago. Again, when I talk about, you know, knowing how much you're spending on things, uh, on, on tracking your dollars and everything else, people have come up to me and asked about, they've told me it sounds like I'm really down on branding. Um, you know, they'll, they'll say, for instance, well, what, you know, what if you have a marketing spend that's going to quote, grow your brand, but you can't put a dollar amount on it. Well, you know, in this case, I would actually defer to what Donald Miller from StoryBrand says. He, um, he's got a great summary where, where he gives the argument that, look, if you're a multi-billion dollar company like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, where everybody in the world already knows you exist, then you can think about branding. How do people feel when they hear the name Coca-Cola? How do they feel when they hear the word Apple or Pepsi? That's fine for them, but that's a different ball game than most of us are playing. You know, for us, you know, if I'm working for Fireside Home Solutions in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the reality is customers, you know, your average customer doesn't know that we exist. And so we can't make them feel a certain way about our brand when they don't know our brand well enough to even care about it. And so th- the reality is I would say everybody in our industry, even the biggest manufacturers, they're in this same boat. And so I would argue with Donald Miller from Story Brand that you need to do marketing, not branding. You need to do tactical marketing that tells customers what problem do you solve, how do they do it, and is their life going to be better after they've taken care of it. Um you got to throw everything into that. And so you see these branding pieces about, um, you know, I was talking to one company where they wanted to come up with a, a branding piece that showcased like their company history from 1975 all the way through, you know, 2018. And it was great. It looked really, really nice, but I looked at it and I was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that in my showroom. I mean, cause, cause the reality is I don't, I don't care about it. Um, it's yes, yeah, a branding piece that's supposed to make people feel warm and fuzzy, but they don't know who you are. There's nothing for them to feel warm and fuzzy about because you're not like Coca-Cola or Pepsi where you've been ingrained into their ethos. You're just a no-name company that's yakking about how great you are and your grandpa was when you started it. You know, it'd be way better for this marketing piece to be focused on the problems the customer has. You know, I'd way rather have something instead of giving me the history of the company, I'd rather have a marketing piece that says, is your house cold? We've made it simple to find the perfect fireplace get in touch with a qualified professional, you know, because that's the, that's the problem that the consumer has. They don't care how long you've been in business for. Um, anyway, this, that's a short answer and I'm kind of off on a, you know, marketing tangent, but I just wanted to, to give a little bit of credence to that. Okay. We are coming to, to the end here. Um, just a couple more. This next question is from Ryan in Washington. And, um, I want to give a shout out to Ryan. She is doing some awesome stuff with her business, uh, chimney techniques where they're investing in video content and social media. And, uh, they actually got a TV show, you know, kind of similar to the office. That's all about them going through, uh, basically life in the hearth industry, which is so rad. So here's what she says. Um, what I'm struggling with is transitioning from my dad's method of running as a mom and pop to running as a business with checks and balances with the growth we've seen in the past few years. We just don't have a choice. Ryan, first of all, congratulations. It's amazing that you guys have had that growth. And the struggle that you go through is is an amazing struggle that hopefully more and more businesses will start to go through as they grow. The transition from a mom and pop shop to a true business with checks and balances. Um, you know, I'm going to repeat some of the answers that I've, I've said earlier. I I would refer you to, uh, my ebook roadmap to success, Um, and I would just, I would hit those five steps so hard, expectations and goal setting, investing in your people, auditing your marketing spend, simplifying your website and going all in on the customer experience. Um, you know, I think that, I think that what you're going to need is going to be really diving deep on systems and processes. So I think that we talked about this when we were exchanging, um, a little bit on Instagram is that, is that there's kind of been a sense of tribal knowledge. And that's how it is in a lot of mom and pops where, you know, 
people kind of know a little bit about everything and sometimes stuff falls through the cracks because you thought that someone else would take care of it since they're an expert in that area, but they thought you were going to take care of it because you were an expert in that area. Um, Ryan, for you as a leader, um, you're going to you're gonna have to basically put the lines on the basketball court. Very similar to what I talked about earlier in a sales process. You're going to need to map out, you know, what are the divisions of our company? Even, the, even if that division is one person, even, you know, even if it's two people, we have an installation division. We have a scheduling division. We have a service division. And I would map out what is the role and function that those divisions have to do and how does that align with your central vision. Then from there, you can develop an organizational chart whose responsibility is it in each of those departments to do that work. Um, One thing that I found a lot of success with is for every new hire on my team is they get a written job description and we go through it in laser detail when they get hired and at every one of their reviews. And, And in that... It's going to list some some different criteria for them to have success in their job. So the goal of a job description is to show them, number one, what are the basic expectations that you have for them as a professional? Number two is, what does it look like for them to win? How do you define that? And then number three, what does it look like for them to lose? So again, you know, in a job description, I'm going to put, here's the basic professional pieces that you're going to need in this job. You know, maybe as an installer, you're going to need to be NFI certified. You're going to need to be able to use a tape measure and pass this test that we've shown. You're going to need to be able to uh, quote our signature install process verbatim. Those are the basic professional pieces that you need. Then you can move into, well, what are the expectations of winning? So, you know, say, say that again, sticking with an installer here, you know, you could say that, um, an expectation of winning is to complete installs with a 95% inspection pass rate. You know, it could be to, um, you know, get, 50% of your customers to leave you a Google review after the job is done, whatever it is, but you're defining in like laser detail, this is what it looks like to win. So you can tell them, look, if you can follow through on your basic professionalism and you can follow through in these key areas, you'll win and you'll love life will take great care of you. But you also want to define what losing looks like. So same thing of like, what are the, what are the things that if they do this, it's a, it's a, it's a no go at your company, you know, list that out. And I I think what you're going to find is that going all in on systems and processes again, you know, what are the divisions of our company? How does that align with the vision that I have for where we're going to be going in the future? And then developing checks and balances and in a written job description for every single employee and reviewing that regularly. I think that's going to take you to some wild success and you're going to start to get buy-in. You're going to start to get natural leaders where eventually you can start to put people in charge of these divisions and you can manage those people. And it's going to be an awesome, awesome thing for you. And I I love, I love seeing what what you're doing. So I hope that, that that helps. Another thing with this is, you know, one of the, one of the mantras of our show is that slow is fast. And what you're doing here is a slow is fast kind of thing where you're growing a company and, and you are laying groundwork that has not been laid before. Um, one of my friends, Tim Rethlake, he was the first guest on this podcast. He emailed me a few weeks ago. We were talking about some stuff back and forth and he said, Tim, When you are the first person carving your way through the forest, it's a lot more difficult clearing the path than it is following in the wake behind. And Ryan, that's what you're doing right now. You are carving the path. So don't lose heart with it because your people are going to gravitate towards it. You're going to love it, but you know, it might go a little bit slower than you want, but I'm convinced that if you continue to do what you do, invest in those people, invest in those checks and balances, systems and processes, you are going slow on the front end so that you can run on the back end. I hope that helps you out. Okay, last question here. How would you help me revolutionize my tech's in-home sales performance? It seems like they are the best at selling safety-related jobs, but they shrink back in fear when it comes to asking for the sale on a more aesthetic job. Any advice on what I should do? Again, that's a really, really good question. Um, Number one, I got to compliment the fact that you are doing in-home sales. I am just telling you guys, uh, do in-home sales. It, It is absolutely a gold mine. And, and the fact that you're doing in-home sales as standard procedure is unbelievable. And that actually gets you ahead of a lot of different companies. Um, number two, the fact that you're asking about revolutionizing that process, um, shows me that you're thinking 
long term about this and you're thinking about systems and processes and just again thinking that way is, is going to naturally just start to grow what you guys are doing um here's what i'd say about people shrinking back in fear when it comes to asking you for the sale on an aesthetic job where the where they'll make the sale on a safety job um i think that you'll have to ask yourself if you have the right people on the bus and here's what i mean by that is that you know very often as salespeople, it's easy to sell safety because, you know, they can say, well, if I don't sell this, the house is going to burn down. And and yeah, that's true. And that's great. And you, you absolutely should sell that. But here's the thing is that frankly, we sell an aesthetic product. Anyone that has a fireplace in their house, and I'm, I'm looking at my fireplace right now as I speak, anyone that has a fireplace in their house knows how beautiful these are. And I mean, I'm telling you that I bought my fireplaces for the aesthetics. I didn't buy them for the heat. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I get heat, but I've got a furnace in my house that, that'll give me heat. These are aesthetic, beautiful products, and salespeople have to understand that. Um, if salespeople don't understand why someone would want to buy an aesthetic product like this, and if they're too afraid to say, hey, Mrs. Smith, I know you don't have to do this, but your house won't be the same without it. I'm telling you that your family's going to love gathering around this fireplace. What do you think about moving forward with that? If they are too afraid to do that, I don't think that you have the right people. And so it doesn't mean necessarily you need to fire those folks, but maybe maybe you need somebody else that's out doing the in-home selling or you need to invest in some serious sales training. You know, uh, one thing that, that salespeople have to learn is a lot of the time, you judge people with your own wallet. And so when someone walks into the showroom, um, very often you could be selling an expensive fireplace. You know, there's fireplaces now that are 10, 20, $30,000, whatever it is. And so often salespeople, particularly younger salespeople, they, they'll be talking to a customer about a $15,000 fireplace and the customer will go, well, how much is this fireplace? And the new salesperson will go, Oh, well, this model is, is $15,000. Oh, but, 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 but if, if it's too expensive, you know, you can take away some of the features and drop it down to 12 and we've actually got this other fireplace here. That's only seven. And well, I mean, we've actually, we got our price point model down here. That's, that's 5,000. And, and, and so we just don't, you know, we don't want the price to be a barrier. So we can just get you this $5,000 model that happens all the time. And the thing is, is that the customer never gave the salesperson a reason to do that. It was the salesperson judging the customer by their own wallet rather than listening to the customer's wants and needs and selling them an appropriate product. And so I would make your team radically aware of the fact that these customers don't always have the same pocketbook as you, and it's actually not your right to judge their pocketbook. It's your duty to listen to them, take in the information to understand what they need, and then advise them on the best solution that you know how based on their budget, their means, and the need for their home. And so I would go all in on training like that, but it might come down to it that you don't have the right people on the bus. That's just going to be a question that you'll have to answer as you go down the path. Wow, guys, that was a lot of questions, and I hope that the response has helped you out a lot. I absolutely love the Q&A. So keep it coming. Uh, Thank you so much for the questions. I hope that there was some value in that for you. Okay, guys. Wow. That was a long episode. I am sorry, not sorry that this last episode went so long. And I just got to tell you, you know, what a season it has been. It's been unbelievable just to see um, how this audience has grown and, and the questions that you guys are asking are amazing. I love the fact that you are wanting to dive deep and grow your businesses. I'm telling you, it is going to pay off. Now, before I sign off here, I hope to see you guys at Expo. Remember, on March 13th at 3.30 in the afternoon, I'm going to be speaking. Again, this is at the HPBA Expo in Dallas, Texas. My class is called Make It Easy, How to Sell More by Eliminating Customer Confusion. If you want to grow your sales teams, if you want to revolutionize your process, come to that. I'm going to help you simplify what you do, get rid of the confusion so you can sell more than you ever thought possible. Now, again, if this season has been valuable for you, I would encourage you to download my free ebook, which is called Roadmap to Success. And that is available at the website itsfiretime.com. It's a free download. It's at the website itsfiretime.com. And that can give you some content to munch on while uh, the next few months go by without this podcast before season two starts. So remember, uh, 
I, I really believe that the people listening to this are the future of our industry. And the reason I say that is that listening to a podcast like this requires intentionality. You don't sit back and let this happen to you. You are carving out time, whether it's in your car, at the gym, in your office, with your sales teams, in your meetings. You are carving out time to intentionally grow yourself and grow your company. And I know that it is the future leaders of our industry that are doing this. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in this season. I can't wait to come back live at Expo with the beginning of Season 2 in March. But it has been a pleasure to dive deep with you. I know that you guys are doing amazing things to grow your businesses, and it's an honor to do this with you. I'm going to sign off for Season 1. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. To learn more, visit the website itsfiretime.com. Music from this episode was written and recorded by In Bloom out of Portland, Oregon. We thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. We'll see you next time. I'm all into buying.